And so for me, unpacking OCD was, was definitely chipping at a, a, a big glaciers. The way I see it, it's this big thing that nobody talks about is an elephant in the room, people sitting next to you in the pew, go home to problems they don't talk about. And so I just, I show up where I can and share that it's, I would say it's not, people say, you know, it's okay to not be okay. And I think that's totally true. But I think there's also a space to empower people to say, but you can be okay. Like there are so many tools and there's so many resources. And this season where you're not okay isn't a direct reflection of your identity. Hello and welcome to the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. We're here to help you navigate life while disrupting the status quo. Our discussions cover a number of topics relevant to everyday life. We discuss everything from relationships to entrepreneurship. We also engage in some difficult but important conversations. And now, here are your hosts, Brian and Tanya Hamilton. Hello and welcome to episode 41 of the Disrupt Me Everyday podcast. Today we're joined by Peyton Garland. We're going to talk to her about how she is thriving after her OCD diagnosis. We will be talking about Peyton's journey. She's also an author and will be giving away two copies of her book, Not So By Myself, a safe space where God doesn't fix the loneliness, but sits with you instead. Stay tuned to find out how to win. And now we will get into today's show. Peyton, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, excited to be here. Awesome. Well, we're excited to have you. Mm -hmm. And the first question that we always like to start off with is the loaded question. And that question is, who is Peyton Garland? Oh, she's a hot mess is what she is. But (laughs) if you want want a more formal answer, uh, I'm an author. My debut book, Not So By Myself, was promoted by former White House Press Secretary Dana Perino and endorsed by TED Talk speaker Hannah Brencher. But when I'm not writing books, chatting about books, my husband and I are toting our two gremlin dogs all over Colorado, checking out local coffee shops and hiking. Nice. And it's funny because we've actually interviewed a few different people out in Colorado. So we know that, you know, hiking seems to be a big hobby down there. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of places to hike, lots of beautiful trails and our pups are super active. Like they, they are, they're both still younger. They're like three years old. So it's, it's a really good way for us to stay in shape and do them the service of letting them exercise. And it's just, it's beautiful weather. There's already snow on the mountains in our backyard. Like it's, it's getting cool and we're just enjoying the fall. Now, the one thing you alluded to as well is the book. And I'm curious, what was the catalyst for the book? I know everybody has a story, but what was it that really made you take that formal step of putting it into a book? Yeah. So I I went through a really, really tough season of loneliness. My husband's a pilot. When he first started his career, there was no airline base available at home. So he lived states away. We lived in Georgia at the time. He had to move to Indiana. We had just moved to a different part of Georgia for me to start a new job. So I didn't know my neighbors, didn't know my coworkers. For the first time in my life, I was not near my family. I, I, I had no friends near me. So it was just a hard season of loneliness. You're just by yourself. And I think when you have to sit with yourself in the quiet, there's no one to distract you. I think you have to face some monsters you've kind of shoved in the closet and you've kind of kept them there. I think they can come out and you've got to start working through things. And in that season, I was diagnosed with OCD. I learned a lot of things about my faith, kind of dismantled some things that weren't true and started holding on to grace and some things that are true. And when that season was over and my husband was able to transfer to a base closer to home, I realized that loneliness is something everyone encounters, whether you're married or not in a relationship or not. And the bittersweet reality is I wrote the book a month before COVID hit. And I mean, I had no clue. I'm over here talking about loneliness and how I'm navigating it and then the whole world is facing a loneliness that no one could have anticipated. So, you know, it's kind of an awkward marketing pitch of, Hey, since you're stuck at home (laughs) and a global pandemic, you know, my book might relate to you, but, but it was just, it was something I felt I needed to say because my experience through loneliness, I think some of the healing was catalyzed because other people were present and they showed up in that time and they spoke truth to me. And I would like for this book to kind of be that gap filler for other people as well. So question for you with the OCD diagnosis, did you realize, you know, in your childhood, teen years, young adult years that, you know, there was something that, okay, maybe I do have OCD. You know, a lot of people joked about that. Oh, I, my house is so clean. I have OCD, right? Um, Did you ever feel that, you know, something was there or really was it just in that season that you put your finger on it? 
No, no, that's such a good question because OCD, like you said, is pretty stereotyped and the stereotype is statistically wrong. Mm-hmm. So growing up, I didn't think I had OCD because it, no one ever, I, I don't color coordinate my clothes. My car probably has like gnomes or gremlins living in it. Like it is not clean. So like for me, there was never this thought of it might be OCD. I just thought I worried a lot. I, I just thought I was, a, I, I was a perfectionist as a kid anyway. So I just thought it was just the perfectionism in me. I was just obsessing over everything because everything had to be perfect. But you know, when you end up at a therapist's office, that's because things were just not perfect and and they're not going well. And so looking back now that I fully understand the diagnosis, I do see it. And I honestly see it as young as about four or five. Scientifically, they've only really been studying OCD since the eighties. So they don't fully have a grasp on it, but they do believe it's genetic. So likely I was born with it. And they say, typically, if you have any childhood trauma, it kind of catalyzes it. And so for me, I grew up in a very unhealthy church culture, lots of religious trauma. And my father actually had undiagnosed PTSD from serving in the military for 24 years. So for me, my childhood, you know, growing up with other people battling mental health problems, lots of spiritual things that were not true mixed with undiagnosed OCD. And, you know, by the time I'm 24, 25, adulthood's hard on its own. Like, mm-hmm. And then you you kind of have to unpack some childhood trauma and now a diagnosis. And so that's kind of what therapy has been for me is just this unpacking of what's not true and establishing what is. Now, OCD, obviously for different individuals, it manifests itself different ways. So for you, it was, it was primarily worrying or was was there any other things that kind of stuck out? So, so there's four different branches of OCD and where the stereotype comes from is there is something called contamination OCD where you wash your hands a lot. And I do have a form of that. And then there's symmetry OCD, which is where people get that you have to like symmetry. You have to straighten the picture frames and like there's even numbers here, odd numbers there. But believe it or not, both of those only fit one to 2% of the population who have been diagnosed with OCD. So the other branches are called um, mental thoughts and taboo rituals, OCD, AKA religious OCD, which I struggle with from my church experience. And then harm OCD, which is where you're driving down the road and you hear something under your car. Most people go, oh, I ran over like a piece of rubber or I just hit a pothole. I'll turn my car around because it could have been a person. And what if I hit a person and I don't know I hit a person. And so there's, there's an obsession that's unhealthy. And then there's a compulsion, which is turning around the car and going to check. So it's your, your brain is misfiring. What they do know is your frontal cortex and your ventral striatum, which are in the back of your brain. Those two are supposed to communicate. And that's what tells you how to respond as far as impulses, feelings, your ability to rationalize things. And what they know with OCD is my communication patterns are not correct. So something that's totally rational to you, my brain can't rationalize. An impulse to turn around the car is something you could probably shake off and go, no, that was a pothole. My brain literally won't rationalize. Oh, it's a pothole. And so it's, it definitely manifests with different people in different ways. And lots of times it depends on how you grew up, your experiences like mine with church and and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So with therapy, because obviously with this, there's many different avenues to take. If I can ask you a personal question, um, have you ever introduced medication with it or has it just been therapy? So I, I fought the concept of medication, just to be honest, for like two years, I didn't want it. I thought I, for me, therapy was already humbling enough. Mm-hmm. Like that was already me having to swallow my pride and tell someone I wasn't, I didn't have my life together. And for me, medication was just the, the avalanche. Like that was just the cliff. That was the, okay, you really didn't have it together. It wasn't just talking to someone. Now you have to take full blown medication and fought it and fought it and fought it. And I have a very patient, very loving husband. Who's also very blunt. And finally, one day he was like, Hey babe, you're not you. And I think it took a really hard conversation of of him saying in the most gentle way, it really was a helpful conversation where he was like, this isn't who I married. Mm -hmm. Like this, you used to be so fun loving, like there was energy there. There was a piece about you and, and I love you enough to say, Hey, this isn't you right now. And I miss you. And I know you miss yourself. And like, is like the truth, the truth, like that was a good, healthy slap in the face. And so I ended up starting medication. And it was also a trial and error experience. I think when someone tries a certain pill, like I, they put me on Prozac, terrible. I, four or five weeks in, I was still lightheaded. I couldn't drive a car because I was that dizzy. It caused irregular heartbeats with me. Like it, it was just bad. 
So they put me on Zoloft and Zoloft has been wonderful. So I definitely, you get to a place where if you, if you love the people around you enough, you just swallow the pride and say, okay. And now that little blue pill, I look forward to that little blue pill every morning. So (laughs) Zoloft is my buddy. It's interesting. I, you know, I've had a conversation with an individual before and it was, you know, when they were questioning that and it's like, you're putting so much energy into the therapy that it's just taking so much, but Hey, maybe trying the medication, you'll actually be able to have the energy and, you know, that brain space to implement what you're learning in therapy. Right. So it's sometimes that fine balance. Yeah. Because, you know, with therapy and I love my therapist here and she's fantastic. But therapy is sometimes hard because, you know, you go in there and in the movies, it's just this calm, serene, tell me how you feel. And granted, that's part of it. You have to let the therapist know what's going on in your headspace. But a good therapist challenges you to, to challenge yourself. Like, you know, it's a mental health problem, but there's also so many tools in my tool belt that I can work with it. And so a lot of times I heard things I didn't want to hear and they required me to go home and do things I didn't want to do. And medicine, medicine takes the edge off of that and makes it seem like something that actually is possible. So I did therapy for about a year and a half, just therapy, but therapy plus medication has been a complete game changer for me. Now, the other part that you talked about as well is how your faith tied into it. I'm I'm curious to kind of unpack that a little bit. Yeah. So I grew up in a very legalistic church, lots of hellfire and brimstone. It, uh, women didn't have much of a role. I, I wasn't allowed to lead. Like you could not lead worship. You could not lead preaching of any sort. Um, there was a dress code for women. There was never a dress code for men. Um, you as a woman, it was understood and told you couldn't ask questions about the finances of the church, where things were going, why. And so I, I grew up muzzled essentially. And it took years for me to kind of step away from that church culture to understand that if you, if you look at the Greek word for woman, it's Azer. And, you know, the Bible was written in Greek and Hebrew. And if you translate Azer to its original root, it means warrior. And so God made not just a helpmate for man, but he made a warrior for man. And so I've been unpacking that truth that, that I do have space to speak mm-hmm. because if, if God has created me in his image and his image is love and his image is to comfort and his image is to, sh- to serve and show up for people, then that's exactly what I'm called to do. And, and I can't sit down. I can't sit still. I can't sit on my hands. I can't stay quiet. If it's my job to be in the presence of others and let them know that they have a purpose. So it's taken a long time for me to unpack that because, you know, with mental health, the church doesn't talk about it too much. Mm-hmm. And I, and I don't know that there, there's two reasons there. There are people who truly believe if you have enough faith, you shouldn't have mental health problems. Like that's a lack of prayer. That's a lack of reading your Bible. But I also think there's an ignorance component. I think where people don't know enough about it. So they just don't enter the space. And, and I think that's a very dangerous thing, especially since the pandemic, people have hit depression. Like they, I mean, teenage suicides are tripling statistically. And so for me, unpacking OCD was, was definitely chipping at a, a, a big glacier is the way I see it. It's this big thing that nobody talks about is an elephant in the room. People sitting next to you in the pew go home to problems they don't talk about. And so I just, I show up where I can and share that it's, I would say it's not, people say, you know, it's okay to not be okay. And I think that's totally true. But I think there's also a space to empower people to say, but you can be okay. Like there are so many tools and there's so many resources. And this season where you're not okay, isn't a direct reflection of your identity. And so just showing up and and chipping away at the stigmas, it's, it's uncomfortable in some settings. I have been in some settings with church leaders who just don't understand, don't agree, but, um, the number of people who've read my book and, and they found me on social media. So I, I don't know who they are. I don't know their story. I have heard over and over again, Hey, I read your book. And because of you, I got therapy. I've heard, Hey, I read your book because of you. I'm now a medicine. Hey, because of you, I now know that God doesn't design me to walk around in shame because I have a mental health problem. And you know, it's a, it's a tough story to share, but, but if it creates room for other people to understand that, it's a mental health problem. Your, your brain is an organ. And just like someone with a heart problem or a diabetes problem, they've got to take medicine to make insulin regulate. I have to take medicine to make the chemicals in my brain balance. So tough, but, but worth it to create that space for people. Oh, it's so true. And you know, that's why for our show, this is what we like to talk about, right? Because 
it, it is normalizing what is going on there. And, you know, just talking about what people are dealing with, you know, day in and day out and making it, I guess, normalizing it. Right. So like we're Christian too, uh, for sure. If you're going to church and you're needing, you know, um, guidance and counsel, it, it would be great to be able to go to a pastor or a leader in the church who is able to guide you with that. Right. And I get it. And even, you know, schools and all that, I get it. Not everybody is comfortable with it, but I think at the end of the day, you got to be open to it and open to learning. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things for, so I grew up a Christian school kid. I didn't want to go to Christian college. I was tired of like mandatory chapels and whatnot, but I ended up getting <laughs> my master's and my bachelor's from Christian universities. So I, like, I'm your poster child for the girl who should know all the answers, be able to handle all the problems. You have all the stories. And, and what I realized is sometimes in, in Christian culture, there are so many rules and so many checklists of what you should not be doing that no one says what you should be doing. And so for me, I felt like I should not have a mental health problem. And so now I have no clue what to do because mm -hmm. I've always been told, don't drink, don't sleep around, don't do this, don't cuss, don't do that. Well, what do I do now? How can I actually be proactive with something that I have to react to? Mm -hmm. So for me, walking this rigid line of perfectionism, hitting a wall with OCD where like perfectionism is now completely impossible. As a Christian, what's, what do I step into? What questions do I ask? Because I have to do something, but no, no one in church, no one in Christian school has said what I do from here. And, and I think that's the thing for me is it's an honor to, to maybe not say what to do, but to offer what I've done that's worked and even things that I've tried that did not work. That means a lot to me to turn around and help the next person in line. I kind of want to focus on the last thing that you mentioned there. We, again, we've talked about some of the things that have worked for you, but what were some of the things that you tried that didn't work? Oh, not telling people what was going on in my head, because, you know, I said for years, I just thought I was a worrier. Like everyone worries, especially when you're a perfectionist. I was the valedictorian of my high school class. My sorority nickname was, my maiden name was Hanners and it was Hanners with the V card because I was the only virgin. And so there's like all these boxes I was checking and I was slowly putting myself on a pedestal and didn't even know it. And so then I fall flat on my face because I am internalizing this battle and I'm not saying a word because valedictorians don't go crazy. You know, the good virgin girl, she just smiles on cue. She doesn't have mental health problems. Like I'm being quiet and I'm not saying anything because I think it'll damage other people's perception of me. But in all honesty, like what weight does that hold when you can't identify yourself? Mm -hmm. And so eventually I had to just say, I don't even know who I am. Even with all of these titles, there's so much going on on the inside of me that I've got to unpack a lot of things. So the, the big thing for me was not saying anything for a really long time. And then I think another thing is just like I told you, fighting medication. I pushed that off for a year and a half. And, and I think it probably, my husband's hair wouldn't already be graying if I, if I had, <laughs> had jumped on the medicine bandwagon a little bit sooner. And, and both of those things were a result of pride. Like, like it's a lack of humility that I regret, but also I think I, I needed to land flat on my face to walk into humility with a little more willingness. So a bittersweet sort of thing. So you mentioned your husband. I'm just thinking here, you know, how does it work when now you're in a relationship or you're married, right? So for him to say to you, you're not who I married, right? Obviously yeah. things had changed. However, looking back, you had, you had this when you guys met, right? So how have you navigated this OCD and your marriage? How has that all worked? Well, number one, he, he's my, my best friend. And he, I think God just knew I, I needed him because he's, he's very compassionate. He is very patient and I am like, I am very hot headed. I am not patient. So for, for him to step into this space, where I'm kind of the bad guy for him to, to be the ice to the fire is wonderful because I, in the church culture, I grew up in shame was the game. And so I was already putting a lot of shame on myself because I knew I wasn't me. I knew when it came to arguments and tension in the marriage, I was heaping it on because I had so much going on on the inside. So therapy was great because it, it gave me the educational side of things to understand what was going on in my head. So when I could go, oh, there's like an actual problem with my brain. Like this is a, this is an illness that in a way is physical because my brain is a physical organ. 
what happened is I started giving myself a little bit of grace. So I kind of, it simmered down a little bit, some of the tension and just the constant frustration. But I read the Hunger Games books years ago in high school when they were a thing. And in one of the books, Katniss and PETA play this game where um, PETA had been like brainwashed and he could never remember what had actually happened and what was real. So they play a game called Real Not Real, where he'd ask Katniss a question and she'd just say, that's real or yeah, no, that's not real. With OCD and having so many wild thoughts that can just spiral he is so good where I, I actually said, hey, can we just start playing a game called OCD or not OCD? And so instead of just pinning up all these thoughts and letting them consume me, letting them identify me, I'll just go to him and say, hey, OCD or not. And I'll just say whatever it is. And he'll just say, yeah, that's OCD. You're okay. Like, you're fine. Move on. And so it sounds simple, but stepping into grace for me personally, taking care of myself has helped. And then something as basic as a, hey, OCD or not game has been wonderful because I'm now no longer internalizing it and I'm talking to him about it more. And so for him, he understands it more. So the fact that we both understand the condition better, we see it as a condition and not pain. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a little easier to process. That's, I think, some of the best advice are the, the simple things because we like to overcomplicate things. We, we like to make things harder than they than they need to be. I mean, when you have OCD, that's what you you do for a living. You know, like <laughs> everything's a little bit obsessive. So I am all about the simplicity of things. Excellent. Now, we're we're just getting started, but for anybody who's finding value in this so far, you know, we we've referenced Peyton's book, and you know, I just want to I just want to mention the books. It's called Not So by Myself. And if you're interested, make sure that you share this post on Instagram. Also, write a review, an, an Apple podcast review for us. And we'll give away a couple of copies of this too. If you just said, send a screenshot to us, we'll, we're going to give away a couple of copies of Peyton's book. Okay, so I want to talk about grace. You had mentioned that there, that word a few times, which, you know, I love that. What life experience has taught you the most about grace? Oh, I, I honestly think that there's two and they, they parallel. So growing up with a dad with PTSD that's undiagnosed, you walk a lot on eggshells because, you, you know, I was, I was eight, nine years old and I just knew my daddy wasn't my daddy and I, I couldn't fix him. And I felt like if I said something, I'd break him. And watching my mom walk alongside him for seven years while he, you know, he was in the military. He's this tatted six foot three big, he's not going to talk to a therapist. That's weakness, you know, and, and watching, watching her walk alongside him and love him so well to the point where he eventually learned to love himself again and show up. I, I watched that as a child. So that, that wasn't necessarily me giving grace, but watching my mom give it and then watching my dad be willing to accept it because my dad had went through so much with the military. He had three separate episodes of traumatic brain injury. Like there was a lot to go through. And so you fast forward 15 years later, I'm married and it's, it's almost like I'm my dad. I'm walking through a mental health season. I am not myself. There is a lot going on. My brain too is messed up. And my husband just standing there with me and not going anywhere. I think I don't know that I have given grace so well that I could celebrate it, but that season of being diagnosed and watching my husband stay, I, I think that's probably one of the, the biggest aspects of grace I've ever seen in another person. And I think what I love about grace is it does continue to show up because I think grace sticks around for the journey. Mm -hmm. I don't think grace is a, a one-time thing and it just shows back up when you mess up. I think grace is something that grows you. And so that's what I've enjoyed is, is being vulnerable and finding freedom in that and understanding that when you give up perfectionism, you get to stick with grace. And that's just, that's, that's a breath of relief that you don't get when you try to make things work perfectly all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's a great reminder for all of us, right? Like, yeah, absolutely. You know, nobody's perfect. Obviously we already know that, you know, no relationship is perfect. And especially when you're blending two together, right? It's for the marriages that last, I'm sure grace is at the top of the reason why, right? Like that's it. You if know, you're smiling, I, if you're it, still it, smiling it, and married, grace is there. <laughs> it's one of those things where, you know, marriage opens up all these, you know, areas for grace. And sometimes for me, they're, they're often petty, like, you know, understanding that now for the rest of my life until death do us part, the socks will sit by the hamper. They're not going in the hamper. <laughs> <laughs> they will be beside the hamper until I die. And so I've learned, you know what? I'll just pick them up 
and smile. And we're just going to give him grace because he's cute and he <laughs> tends to cook. So I don't have to. So just little things here and there make, make a big difference in the world of grace and marriage for sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> for some reason i knew the reference was going to have something to do with socks i don't know why but i knew socks were coming Are you, do your socks go missing too and never make it to the washer or dryer mine usually make it to the washer or dryer a lot of times they don't survive the washer and dryer i don't know what, what happens to them he's oh he has like a bin of random socks and it's not necessarily his fault it's probably That's, mine and the kids who do the laundry and all well, i say there's i think there's a, a dryer monster in everybody's <laughs> trying to keep half the socks because this is a this is a humanitarian problem i don't think this is a localized issue so totally totally understand oh man <laughs> now in terms of the book you know obviously this was uh you know this was something that was built on your experience mm -hmm what do you think the biggest takeaways are going to be for, for readers? So as someone who grew up in church culture, I got very tired of churchy sayings, like in, in a hard season of loneliness, I was like, if one more person tells me God will never leave me nor forsake me, <laughs> I, I will tattoo it on their forehead and just go <laughs> on. Yeah. I, I got really tired of hearing Jesus will leave the 99 to come after you. I'm like, yes, I got it. There's also 50 other people he probably needs to go get to like, <laughs> well, okay, story, my story in a way that even if you're a non-believer, even if you're someone who's wary of the church, or I know that the, the blurb these days is called seeker. If you're looking into the faith, you're seeking it. I wanted to make a space for everyone to show up and understand that number one, grace is something we can all give, but in order to give it to others, we have to give it to ourselves. So, so there's some perfectionism. You absolutely have to step away from uh, too, that there's, there's so much freedom and vulnerability. I thought freedom was, was having the, the ego looking a certain way, checking the box. And that doesn't work. The, the most free I've ever felt is when I've started being vulnerable about what's going on on the inside. And also for the believer, the tagline of my book is something I thought long and hard about. I prayed about the, the title, not so by myself, came super easy. That just wasn't even a second thought. But the tagline is a safe space where God doesn't fix the loneliness, but sits with you instead. And I, for the believer, I just want them to recognize, for me, it was a season of loneliness and mental health struggles. But regardless of whatever phase of life it is, that's just not working. The beauty of God is his loyalty and the process and that he works best in the mess. Like that is where he, I mean, he, he literally changed the world dying on a cross, like messy things are what have revolutionized mankind for the better. And so I just wanted to offer that hope that if you're in a, in a place that's just not working, stuff is working and, and you just, you don't want to say, oh, just hang tight because things will get better, but be willing to, to see how you are changing, how things are getting better on the inside. And just wanted to create a space for people to understand that. If they think they're crazy, your girls got you beat. So, you know, we, I unpack a lot, a lot of things and a lot of experiences, hoping someone else can relate. Awesome. Now, I, I want you kind of just to, I, I ask a lot of people to do this, but just kind of play a game with me here. All so right. I want you to just knowing what you know now, mm -hmm. being, if you were able to go back and have a conversation with yourself, you know, pre-diagnosis, pre before you came to the realization that something needed to change. If you could go and approach Peyton, you know, let's say 10 years ago, and have yeah. a conversation with her, you know, as Peyton today, what would you tell her about perfectionism and what she needs to be prepared for, for the next 10 years? I would tell her something that my mom told me the day I finally told her that things were not right in my head. Like I, I, I pinned this up. I didn't tell my mom for 10 years. Like, it's, it's funny you say that it was just about 10 to 12 years. But when I finally spilled my guts to her, she told me, she said, this is, this is a mental health problem. We will get through this. She was so gracious, but she did say, you've got to remind yourself of two things. This is not God, the lies, the shame, the fear. This is not God. And he does not work this way. And so if this is not God and he does not work this way, then there is a better God and there is a better way. And you don't have to live in this, this miserable, dark bubble you've put yourself in. And I think I would tell Peyton, the same thing about perfection, like God doesn't operate out of perfection and his way is so much better than that. And I'd also, I would tell her the second you step into the hard things and you're open and honest about them, 
you're going to have friends come out of the woodworks. I, I thought for me, it would almost be people packing up and walking away, but it has created friendships for me and a community for me that is family. And so I'd tell her the opposite of what you're thinking is going to happen is going to happen. And it's all going to be for the better. Mm. Yeah. And in those difficult times, the, the, the right people will, they tend to appear when you're, when you're ready for them. And the blessing is the wrong people walk away. And you know, the sting of that is very temporary when you see sometimes how healing it can be to just be with the right people and also be not around the wrong people. It's so true. It's funny. I was actually just going to ask a question about loneliness. So yeah. I think, I feel like we all deal with it, especially, mm -hmm. you know, over these last almost two years, right? right? It doesn't matter if you're in a house, our house is four kids, you know, there's six <laughs> of us, right? We all can feel lonely at times. Yeah. So what do you say, you know, what do you speak on in regards to that for somebody who's, you know, in a home full of people mm -hmm. or to that person who's on their own? Yeah, I think what I, what I like to tell people, because I've had several people ask me that is, is don't be afraid to tell God that you're lonely and don't be afraid to tell him that it sucks. I, for the longest time, I thought pleasing God was showing up with the right prayer and faking having the right attitude and just thinking somehow that would fix things. And some of the most pivotal prayers in my life have been when I've told God straight up, I don't like what you're doing. Like I, I have told God before, like just straight up, almost like I'm talking to a surfer. I said, I don't like what you're doing, man. Like, this is not, this is not cool. Not and so I you no, know, exactly. This was not what I really signed up for. But when you're honest with God, it forces you to be honest with yourself. And I think so often we're lonely, even if we're sitting in a room full of people, because we've lied to ourselves for a really long time. I think we've lied to believe we're not worthy of community. We're not worthy of a God looking out for us. We're not even worthy to, to speak kindly to ourselves. And so I think loneliness, a lot of times in my life was a direct result of me letting shame isolate me. And so, so for the person who's around a ton of people, I encourage you to be mindful of how you're talking to yourself. Like sometimes I notice it and I'm like, oh, Peyton, this is not, this is not how you need to talk to yourself. I'll notice when my prayer life is lacking, where I'm just not as honest and vulnerable as I need to be. And so I just, I really encourage people to, to be honest with God and with themselves, regardless of if they're physically by themselves or if they're in a room full of people. Thank you. Yeah. Another thing, and this is probably going to seem like a weird question too, but as a, I'll say recovering <laughs> perfectionist, <laughs> how, how difficult was the book writing process? You know, I, <laughs> I, writing the book. So what happened is I, I pitched it when the pandemic first started, a publisher picked it up and I was very thankful, but they were like, Hey, we really need to get this book out before the pandemic ends. Like, not that we want to prolong like global <laughs> isolation, but this is really good marketing. So I wrote 60,000 words in 30 days. So it was a very, very quick process, but editing was brutal. Like I found, I think I've, I've had people read my book and say, there's not a single error in this. I love it. I've went back and read it and found things where I'm like, oh, I don't like that. No. And so I won't, I won't read my book. Like it is on a shelf it is there, but I am not reading it because I'm, I'm not looking at the parts that I don't think are perfect. Yeah. So, you might not have changed any of that. <laughs> well, it's just, you know, statistically you're like 60,000 words. Like there's going to be something in there that's not right or you don't like, but in my head, I'm like, no, 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 that's not, that's not how Peyton should work. But it, it was so good for me. Like the second I found something that I didn't like, or that I feel like the editor and I might've not been on the same page. I breathed because it was over. I'm like, oh, okay. It's not perfect. I know it's not. <laughs> We'll just put it on the shelf and it's good. And it fits the theme of my book. Like I li literally, I think the error, there was one page where I was, I was quoting myself and I was like, that sucks. And I left the S off of sucks. So it's just suck. And my grandmother was like, baby, it just sucks that you misspelled suck. And it's okay. You can move on now. <laughs> and I was like, okay, we can work with that. And so perfectionism, you know, I, I still like it with certain things like a book, but also I got to practice what I preach at some point. Mm. So what better way than to say, Hey, here's where I've dropped the ball and misspell five letter words. <laughs> oh man. For those who don't win the book, where can they get the book and where can they, where can they follow you? Where, where can we learn more about what you're, what you're up to these days? 
Sure. So Amazon is going to be your quickest way to get the book. So not so by myself on Amazon. And if you want to know more about the book, like there's more background information, I have a blog. It's PeytonGarland.me. So that's my website. You'll get lots of background information. And I always tell people there's a little contact button on my website. And it really is for like speaking engagements. Like there's a business side to it. But I also tell people if they've read my book and they want to chat mental health, chat about, I, I have a whole chapter about how terrible my dogs are. Like if you have bad dogs, bad kids, <laughs> you just want to talk. I say, if anyone's read my book, I'm happy to hop on a Zoom call with them and just talk, just meet face to face and share more life. So I'd love to connect with people there too. Oh, that's awesome. This conversation has been really good. And I think, you know what, for the person who is struggling with maybe the same thing as you, you know, other mental health, you know, different things that they're dealing with. And for other people who just want to be support, I think, you know, the more we learn, the more we can help people in our circles, right? The more we can be a support to them and a friend to them. So I really appreciate the conversation that we've had. Thanks for having me. It's been awesome. Thanks for listening to the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. For more ways to listen, connect with us on social media. To be a guest or to partner with us, check out our link tree at Disrupt the Everyday. Join us next time for more ways to disrupt the everyday.